Welcome to Access Rhode Island and its program Kids Count. My name is Elizabeth Burke Bryant and I'm Executive Director of Rhode Island Kids Count, a children's policy and advocacy organization that works to improve Rhode Island children's health, education, safety, and economic well-being. Every time we have an Access Rhode Island program, we are really thrilled to bring you another children's issue or an issue affecting children, youth, and families. And today's program, I'm so excited, is about after school programs and summer learning programs and who better to talk to about that kind of topic than our own Hillary Sammons who is the executive director of the Providence After School Alliance. So great to welcome you to the program. Thank you Elizabeth, it's great to be here. Well tell us what PASA is. I guess the acronym is PASA which is the Providence After School Alliance and many of our viewers I'm sure have heard about your work but just in case if you could start with a description of your organization. We're a collective, a public-private partnership of the city and a whole team of nonprofit organizations that um, work together to bring an after-school system right now to all 45% of the middle school youth in Providence and we're working together with lots of organizations to think about how to do that well in the high school arena. So unlike a program, we're a system and that sounds sort of boring but it's not. It's a lot of fun and it's uh, a, a way for the city um, and the school department, the mayor's office, the parks department to all work together with the nonprofits in a sort of seamless way to create something that youth can come in and pay, make lots of cool choices and not be worried about where it's going to be and how it's going to happen, um, but uh, they have really good learning experiences. Well, if you are reaching beyond the 45% mark of Providence school children, is that what you said? Yes, 45% of the middle school students in the five schools we're in. We're in five of six middle schools in Providence. Well, that's a big number, and that is sort of a systems change kind of thing rather than a program by program approach. Let's just back up for a moment and just put it in context. When you and I were growing up, it was a usual school day, a lot of playtime in the neighborhood after school, a lot of pickup sports games and that kind of thing. I won't tell you how I was always the last person picked for wiffle ball, but you get the point. Why do we need a system of after school and summer learning programs these days? What's different? Well, what's different is it, 10 years ago, before we were really started, there were about 6,000 middle school students in Providence that when the bell rang at 2.30, they just headed out into the streets. Um, some of them went at home, but we know from surveying them that some of them were at home alone playing video games. And there just were, there just were not the opportunities, particularly for middle school youth. I mean, I think for elementary school, we kind of know it's against the law to leave kids at home alone, so everybody scrambles around and figures out where to place elementary school youth. Mm -hmm. But I think in middle school youth, um, it, was, it was much less obvious where to, to connect them to programs, and there were fairly limited um, quality programs in the, in the city. So it was, you know, dropping by the rec center or going to the library, but it was, it's, it was pretty random and willy-nilly 10 years ago. Now it's, it's all much better organized and there are choices for young people. But it's not like our day where, number one, school got out at 2.30 and we you know, hit the woods or the back vacant lot and it was relatively safe. And um, there was less demanded of us, I think, in terms of academic expectations and social, emotional, and physical development. We just played hard. Um, mm -hmm. But now there are, I think, more demands on young people, um, what's expected for them in terms of their growth. And there's just less, there was less out there in Providence. Um, when, when you started researching this with then Mayor Cicilline, middle school was really identified as the big hole. Mm -hmm. And I think it is nationally, not just in the cities, but I think in the suburbs, what to do with your middle school youth. Um, if they're not doing a part-time job or studying and writing a paper, um, they're wandering around a little bit more lost than I think in any age, other age group. Well, we were really excited to be brought in as Rhode Island Kids Count to help develop the business plan that sort of gave birth to PASA. And um, we were really struck by the kind of data that you're, you're focusing on, the number of children home alone, um, the lack of connection to anything that can really help with school success. And, and yet there was, in Providence at the time, really a number of organizations doing very good work at a programmatic level, reaching kids, including middle school kids. How did you reach out to key partners when you got started? Well, we, I was very lucky because I inherited a team that you and, and then Mayor Cicilline organized. There were a hundred of them that you assembled. I was part <coughs> of that team and it was a group of, you know, the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, City Arts, um, informal sports organizations, the libraries, the parks, the recs, and everybody sat together to say, what, what do we need to do to make this more seamless for parents and youth to access high quality experiences? So 
quite frankly, when I was asked to take the lead, I was handed off by you about 100 amazing active organizations that were really trying to figure out how to work collectively um, and also with schools. I think the challenge is schools have not had, in particular in Providence, any intramural sports after school, um, limited access to arts programs. And when you, we looked at the programs around the city, many of them said they're, very, they're filled to capacity with elementary school age, and then there's some very unique high school oriented groups that work with 100 youth in like new urban arts or youth in action. But there was a really big hole in middle school, which I remember what your team was astounded to see so many middle school kids were reporting that they, you know, other than dropping by rec clubs and, and boys and girls clubs, there was much less available to them. Well, just to start with sort of the breadth of your program now, um, if a parent was interested in Providence, what kind of program, programming do you offer to middle schoolers in Providence, and how do parents and kids get involved? Well, this is how it works. We have um, really now four seasons. Um, in the school year, there's a fall season, a winter season, and then in the spring, a, a six-week season. And each student in the middle school gets like a brochure. Um, it's like a course catalog, really. And they get to pick programs that are, are of interest to them. Um, and we usually offer programs on a Monday, Wednesday, to Tuesday, Thursday basis. So a child might sit down with his parents and say, I want to do soccer two days a week, and then filmmaking on the other two days. Um, and then in every program, we have this thing called Club After Zone, with this, which the city year volunteers run, where students get to go and do some interactive sports and some academic work and, and again, picks, pick things to do. Um, developmentally, we've learned that middle school youth really need to have choices. They like to do things with their peers. So each semester, um, we have a fair in the schools, and the principals and teachers bring the sixth grade through or the seventh grade through, and we have this big open fair where the community boating has got a video of their sailing program, and there's a tennis program, and then there's the city arts are doing ceramics, and everybody promotes um, their programs. They get to meet the instructors, and then they you know, that age group likes to figure out what their peers are doing, so they'll go around and say, let's do ceramics this time, or let's try basketball, and they team up and sign up and take their sign-ups home and parents sign it. So it's, it's very um, youth choice oriented, and families get to decide what to do, and they could either do two days, we prefer four days of programming, and they can do that in the fall, the winter, and the spring, and we just, in the last few years, have started offering summer um, because we really feel like the more we reach the kids through a multiple year strategy, the more likely they're to get engaged in learning and, and succeed. Well, that is great, and I've been at some of your fairs, and they're very high energy. And I'm just curious to know, do you get consistent participation from the students once they sign up? Do they tend to form a bond with whoever is teaching the program and come pretty consistently? Well, we've, got, we've really focused on youth as a customer and really tried to brand the idea of the after zone um, as the experience. And so we have some real loyalty to young people um, get psyched up for each semester and they want end up wanting to try things. I think the interesting thing about middle schools, we tend to think we want, you know, if we get them in a sport, they've got to be really competitive. Well, I think a lot of middle school youth would like to try sports and see which ones they're good at. They don't necessarily want to jump into dad's favorite sport right away and become, you know, the, 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 the penultimate. They might want to try some sports that they've never even heard of or experienced before. So, you know, you tend to have some athletes and then the artists, but the good thing is, at that age, there's a desire to explore and, and experiment and try things out. So I think they, they tend to, to pick a, a variety of experiences. And they're all run by community leaders, you know, the drum instructors from the community. There's a great guy, Willie Smith, who does guitar instruction. He, I ran into him the other day, and he said he's raised donations of guitars on eBay, so every student will be able to go home with a guitar this year, and he's, he's very excited about that. He's just an amazing, a RISD graduate who's teaching guitar instruction. Um, and from that to community boating, where they're going out and sailing, and they do treasure tracking, where they actually hide caches of treasure out in the boats, sail to them, and give their GPS coordinates. So a lot of these programs are full of adventure and also incorporate some fun math and science skills and uh, literacy skills. So the youth don't even know that they're actually learning cool stuff. So you've really proven that um, if you have the right kind of partners in the community with these community engaged um, organizations and the right kind of curriculum, you really can have fun and learning experiences all wrapped up into one. And what is, you know, I know that from our research before PASA was started that you know, there, there had been in the past, and there still is around the country and here in Rhode Island, some well-meaning programs, but they aren't well-run, they aren't connecting to a set of educational outcomes that 
are really good connectors to what's going on in school. How do you navigate that, the dual goal of engagement, yeah. fun, as well as a connection to academics? Well, right from the get-go, when you developed the plan, there was a survey of parents, and the parents and youth said that, I remember it was one young boy who said that he would uh, be willing to uh, walk across the city for a great program, but he wouldn't cross the street for a bad one. And there was a huge amount of inconsistency, but it was the recommendation of your plan for us to look at um, setting some quality standards and providing professional development and training and assessing whether the program was of quality or not. And we did that um, in the first years. We set a set of quality standards defined with the community, not only the province community, but the whole state, working together with the Rhode Island After School Plus Alliance, a set of standards that were common practices around the country. And then we looked at assessments that would be self-assessments that if you know the drum instructor and or the coach were visited by somebody who had a, you know, an example of good practices and reviewed their practices and shared what, you know, a ranking with them and then worked with them to coach them about improving their practice, that people would be very interested in, in self-improvement. So instead of being sort of, you know, police state qualitative review, we've really developed a set of practices where we, we coach and support organizations that want to improve their work and, and give them actual techniques and invite them to, to professional development workshops where they can actually get better at what they do. So what we're finding is all boats are rising. And right. before it used to be a sort of patchwork quilt of quality. Now we are actually ranking with a validated assessment ourselves against states across the country. And I can honestly say that our 80 to our 100 of our groups are all ranking in the top three and, and four. Um, highest levels of, of quality performance. And that's all been self-induced, um, self uh, which is exciting. We've given them the sort of roadmap, but they've all stepped up. That is great. And speaking of national recognition, I know Providence is often looked at as a laboratory city because you have such diversity, uh, high levels of poverty, multiple schools. Are you finding that the Providence After School Alliance is becoming a model for other places? Well, we are because I think a lot of cities are in this quandary of what to do and how to engage middle school youth. We know that so many young people are getting disengaged and dropping out in ninth and 10th grade, and it's in middle school that you lose them. And where we are an example is because other cities are looking to our public-private partnership and the leadership of Mayor Tavares and now Superintendent Sue Lucy, the fact that the superintendent and the mayor are working with the nonprofit community in a collective way around a common set of goals and all holding ourselves accountable and looking at how to maximize resources. So they're looking to us because of that partnership. And the mayor's leadership, Mayor Tavares's leadership, and he sort of had a model life experience around after school. People are really impressed with his vision and commitment, as well as the superintendent. So other cities and mayors are coming to us with, with United Ways and other philanthropies saying, how do you all work collectively? Um, and I think sometimes we think of Providence and Rhode Island as being really turfy. But the city should be really proud of the collective effort that so many nonprofits and the city and the schools and principals and teachers are now all engaged in. And people want to know how we're doing it. And, and the state should be very proud of, of the work that's happened in, in Providence. Well, and I think that there was a recent um, breakfast or policy convening by Mayor Taveras with people coming from other places to hear about what you do. And that's great. Yeah, no, it, it is. And I think sometimes in Rhode Island we like to we um, put ourselves down a little too much, and I, I really think we should celebrate when we, um, we, ha we have something to celebrate. And I, I, I think our after-school work, not only in the city, but throughout the state with our state alliance, is quite impressive. People are looking to us to say, how is it that you're doing this quality work, and how do you work so well as a city and as a state? So you're referring to the alliance, meaning the statewide after-school right plus, after plus alliance, alliance right. which is headed by Adam Greenman right. and is a good partner of yours, I Great know. Great partner, yes, absolutely. And so how is it funded? I mean, when you're, when you're reaching 45% of middle school students in these large schools in Providence, is it a public-private funding partnership as well? It is. It's um, the Wallace Foundation launched us, and then Bank of America stepped up with a, a major contribution that lasted multiple years, and they're continuing to support us. And it's a mixture of national foundations foundations, uh, local foundations, Rhode Island foundations, very supportive, as well as money from the city. Um, mm -hmm. the, the mayor's office has continued to support us with about 10% of our budget, the city council and the mayor standing behind that. And recently the federal dollars um, from coming to the school department was raised to the top and the school improvement grants is starting to fuel our summer program and our collective work with teachers. We're bringing teachers together with some of our community partners um, and we're actually bringing programming into the school day and that's helping to fund it. So it's a mixture, a blend of public and private funds, both locally 
um, and then nationally. And we've started a fun new project called My Pasa Sukasa, where we've invited families um, to donate their houses for the Brown graduation. Um, and when families come into town, sometimes people flee um, because they don't want to get in the, in the traffic. And we've been asking people to donate their houses. And then um, Brown graduation families are renting the houses for significant amounts of money. And we've just raised $25,000 with 10 houses being donated, and we're hoping to grow that. And we'd be willing to take on the RISD graduation or the PC graduation. Oh, that's a great but idea. it's our way to bring in foreign currency and our, <laughs> giving our economy a little leak, <laughs> not having to have fundraisers and asking everybody for local contributions, but to get uh, sort of a social enterprise project going. Well, that is great. Well, two um, topics that I would like to dive deeper into. One is, what's the reaction of teachers been to the work that you've done after school and now in the summer? And then we'll switch to summer and here what you're doing for kids Well, in it's the grown over time. The, te the teachers were at the, at the beginning, I think, a little apprehensive, like we were going to invade the schools and you know, you know, take over their classrooms and maybe make a mess. And so they stood back, and, and we really wanted to make sure that logistically we had absolutely no impact on, they've got enough demands on their lives oh, yes. not to mess up the classrooms and be disruptive or leave a mess. So I think we proved ourselves over the first couple of years as being extremely well organized and efficient and, and, and neat and responsible and accountable. And then we kept inviting teachers to come and do some programming and instruction. And they started to trickle in and apply. Some teachers wanted to do crochet after school. They didn't all want to. They'd done math all day. They really wanted to actually change it up, which is ideal because students need to see their teachers as passionate human beings who have hobbies and interests and aren't just one, you know, in, in one category. Um, and so we've grown sort of from 12 teachers to most recently in the summer hiring 50 teachers. Great. Um, and the programming is starting to get much more interwoven and interconnected, which is really exciting to us. I mean, we've even had a teacher, I mean, any teacher that calls and wants to do something, we respond to because we really feel like creating a seamless day and a, a learning environment where adults are all working together is, is incredible. But we had one teacher who was amazing. Um, special ed instructor who wanted to teach horseback riding. And I was like, what do we do? Do you have a stable we could take these kids to? We go, sure, I'd love you to do horseback riding. What's your plan? And she goes, well, I've got two horses. I just need a ring and a stable. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to come up with that? Well, it dawned on me at a police chief meeting that there was the mounted command and they've got a ring and they've got stalls. So we've matched her and her horses up and Young people That's are over great. at the Mounted Command. So this is where this public-private thing happens, where the police department works with the school department, and we get kids there, and, and it, it becomes a really fun you know, adventure for, the, for teachers and young people. So I think that's one of, one of the best examples of a teacher thinking outside the box. Well, that is so great, and I can just see the children lining up with the police horses and the donated horses, and, and really in, an, in a city environment, getting that excitement of learning equestrian, yeah, whatever fantastic. you call it. Well, um, on, on to summer. I, I was at a national conference and saw a very compelling video about something called summer learning loss mm -hmm. that particularly when you look at low-income children who typically do not have access to the kind of rich experiences in the summer, whether it's through travel, museums, camps, that their more advantaged peers do, that there literally is this um, backslog of slippage, right. slippage of knowledge and just further has an effect on their lack of readiness when the next school year starts, setting teachers back, setting students back. In fact, the little video, it has a Gumby doll on it, and it's on the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading website. Mm -hmm. If viewers want to click on gradelevelreading.net, you'll see a few different videos, and this is the one on summer learning loss. Great. That's something that I know must have been very disconcerting to you. Here you make all of these gains for kids, you're working with teachers, and then in those summer months you lose ground. What have you done about it? Well, about four years ago, we started to, to go into the summer arena and trying to figure out a way to do that so it didn't feel like after school or it didn't feel like school, but it felt like camp and learning and a, you know, a rich learning environment. Um, took some experimenting, and we've kind of, I think, reached a good place where what we did is we've invited teachers to join our community partners to co-design a summer experience that's really about getting kids out into the field. As you said, I think, you know, young people who go to the museums and, and are experiencing a broader context than just their neighborhood and their home environment really benefit tremendously. It's sort of the experiential learning that makes what goes on in the classroom relevant in, in later in the year. So we teamed up teachers and providers, and they're co-designing. Um, we're focusing on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And they're focusing on 
how do we do increase-based learning, project-based learning, where we're trying to solve a problem in four weeks, and we go deep out in the field, um, and we develop a curriculum strategy that's a bit of math and research, um, but it's, it's about the learning experience in the field. So we now have 12 uh, organizations. Um, Audubon is paired up with a science teacher. Save the Bay is doing work with a math and science teacher. Um, and we've got 12 organizations, the Exchange, City, uh, Community Boating. And each one of those teachers have looked at some math content areas that they want to explore in a deep way and in an experiential way. Because we find so many of our young people just don't have that context. I mean, last year we had a young student come running up to somebody at Audubon and discovering for the first time a squirrel. And um, that was for us speciesation and identifying a new species and not many human beings get to call out a new species every day. So making that a really robust learning experience, which is very scientific and exciting, is important. Um, particularly when we had a student last year who had never heard of museums and didn't know what a museum was and had never experienced a museum before, but now that she'd spent her summer in the Natural History Museum, she never wanted to leave the museum and she would be happy to live there for the rest of her life. So oh, isn't that something? I keep thinking our kids are not going to test well if they don't know what squirrels are and they don't know what the museum is. You, you've got to have context for your learning and it can't just be about vocabulary in a classroom, it has to be applied and relevant and have meaning for young people. They have to discover something or want to solve a problem. And the summer is a perfect time for teachers as well because then they can dive deep on some core areas in their, in their curriculum that they just haven't had a chance to do um, outside the classroom and, and having, again, living context to solve a problem together with colleagues in the field and with young people as colleagues and as fellow scientists and researchers is really exciting for all parties. I think it's as, as exciting for the adults to be problem solving as it is for the young people. So to be doing that collegially together um, in a discovery way um, makes for an incredible professional development experience for both the, the community provider and the educator as well as for the young learner. And how many young people are you serving this summer and are there any slots left for people who might be very yeah. excited hearing you Two talk? Two weeks ago there were slots. We, we went from 180 last year to 820 oh, this year. Wow. And we've, um, this is we've children, right? Just, yeah, we've just met our mark and we've hired 50 teachers to work with uh, 24 different providers. We have 80 staff all working. They're going to be in each of the six schools. Um, so we're right now full, but if someone was desperate, we'd put you on a waiting list because we sometimes things come up and slots open up. So and are they for primarily what age kids? Middle school. So incoming sixth graders, seventh and uh, incoming uh, sixth graders. So those leaving the fifth grade, sixth graders and seventh graders, and next year's eighth graders. Well, congratulations to scale up with a summer program like that by that degree is really amazing. Well, I know when lucky. when you were they doing have, work to expand into high schools, and if we could spend just a brief minute. I know that there, um, there's more independence among high school students, but I know for a long time that was also a gap. Is PASA still working with high school students yes, as well? Yes, we are. We've got a, a ninth grade and 10th grade program called Hub Zone, where graduates from the after zone get trained to go back as counselors in training to work with the providers they used to be you know, in the program with. Um, and we trained some a first cadre of young people this, this year. And then we've started this ELO for credit project that RIASPA, Rhode Island Africa Plus Alliance, um, started with some Nellie Mae funding. And we um, are matching the community-based organizations with students in one high school so they can get grade credit for their learning beyond the high school. So we had young people designing apps with Brown engineers. We had uh, young people learning Drupal code and developing websites and the Rhode Island Urban Debate League. Young people, actually some of them went to, I think, a, 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 the state and national championship. So being part of debate club is, you know, politics, civics, what you do for a living, <laughs> getting credit for Elizabeth. You can be getting credit for what you do for a living. Hey, well, I these students, sign up. These students did, and we're hoping to expand that in, um, in a few more high schools this year. We're waiting to hear for some possible funding. The Rhode Island Foundation just funded us to expand that. So again, seeing young people, we actually had young people um, do their final presentations with members of the business community, with their faculty, and of the 30 young people, eight of them have summer jobs now as a result of doing their presentations in front of business leaders. We're so impressed with what their learning was, they wanted to take them on. So this whole middle school, high school continuum, um, learning and experiencing and testing the limits beyond the classroom, I think are essential. And doing that with teachers and collegially with the schools, um, it's an exciting day for us in Rhode Island. People want to know, how are you doing it? How are you getting all these that teachers to so work great. with the community? It's great. Well, they do every day, and this is just another way of doing that. It is. So as we conclude, I just really want to salute the leadership that you've pointed to. I mean, this was started as a vision from Mayor Cicilline, then Mayor Cicilline, um, readily embraced by Mayor Tavares and 
I just also you know, think that you've described beautifully the role of teachers that have embraced this as another way of um, both new ways of learning and ways to sustain the gains that children are making. And I really finally want to salute the, the up close and personal providers of these programs for kids. I think I've been so impressed by the cadre of incredibly dedicated people who work with youth in our city. And I know they really inspired this, whether it was Youth in Action and then Young Voices, some of the more anchor institutions that have worked for generations, such as the Y and the Boys Club. All of these, it's an army of people who care about yes. youth. It is. And I'm sure they've inspired you as well. They've been an inspiration. They really have. They put um, young people first. And they don't have lifetime careers and pensions and nice big packages. They're very modestly paid. But they are passionate about young people's success. And they really want to learn about how to be better. And that infectious nature is, is I think, triggered all of us to, to work together. And I think it's inspired the teachers that have started, have begun to work with them, and the cross-fertilization that's taking place of, of sharing of techniques and strategies. Um, it's opening the teachers to different ways of, of learning. It's, it's, been, it's been a real lift. It's, it's so much fun to be with the young people and see them grow and their lights light, their, their eyes light up but it's as equally rewarding to see these instructors give so much of their time to young people well when you can see that it inspires a young person to have a passion about a, a new talent or something they want to do um, when they grow up it pretty is pretty exciting and it is. you know we also have the arts community that really we have so many efforts as we're oh. sitting here right now there are students in area colleges that may be thinking up the next urban arts or community music works or college visions. There's just so much rich talent. So as we conclude, is there any way for people to get involved if they're interested? Well, if, if organizations or there are people who would love to be instructing middle school youth or high school youth, they should call us. I actually took some chairs to be caned and found out the guy who was caning my chairs was a paleontologist and he used to teach high school and I said, go apply, go online. He says, I could be doing fossils in the day with middle school kids. I'm like, yes, please apply. So, so they um, can we're contact you through your website? At mypasa.org. And there's an application that's due on the 6th of July if you're interested in running a program. So apply. We might even pay you a little bit to, to do that. Or just uh, give me an email, ring, and I'm happy to talk to you and come take you on a tour and learn about what you think you could do to contribute to changing the lives of young people in Providence. Well, I want to thank you, Hillary Sammons, for your hard work heading up the Providence After School Alliance. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in to Kids Count on Access Rhode Island. See you next time.